All right, welcome back. So today I'm gonna give you five easy steps, easy steps to drastically improve your photography. A lot of you are gonna be thinking I'm crazy. These steps are just way too easy or I can fix it in Photoshop. Yes, you can fix things in Photoshop, but if you want better photography, you need to follow these steps. So step number one is really simple, shoot raw. Raw photos are far superior than JPEGs out of the camera. My camera actually doesn't even take good JPEG images. Raw is gonna give you a much larger bit depth and color depth in your image than a JPEG photo will. It's also gonna be part of step number two, which is exposure. It's gonna allow you to adjust things after the fact. A raw image is just a capture, nothing's applied to it. In a JPEG, you take a picture and then the camera computer processes that image. The processing is the application or applying information to that photo. Raw, we do it after the fact. And in this case, we're gonna be doing it in this program, which is Adobe Camera Raw, but you can do it in any raw conversion program. And just uh, let it be known, you know, Photoshop is not a raw conversion program. You can't actually edit a raw photo in Photoshop. You must use a raw conversion program for it to work. So now we've got some exposure examples and I'm gonna talk a little bit about why exposure is so important. I always see these different people that put out videos, how to fix this horrible photo. So they're talking about an image like this, how to make this perfect. Well, sure, you can make it come out and you can save this image, but it's never gonna be a great image because it is gonna fall apart and you're gonna get these weird color shifts. The best thing you can do is take a good exposure like this. Your initial exposure is important. And what do I mean by good initial exposure? How do you know that you have that? Well, one, you're holding highlight detail, which I think is the most important. So we're not losing that highlight detail like we have right here. The highlight detail is gone. And once you've lost highlight detail, a lot of times, even in raw, you can't bring that back. It's gone, it's gone, it's never coming back. So it's important that you get that accurate exposure and it's nice and even. What you wanna do in photography is make the smallest adjustments as possible meaning that we don't wanna come over here and go woo or woo this way. We just wanna make little teeny adjustments to the image. That's not going to manipulate the image data as much and have it cause to either add grain or fall apart. This is actually a good exposure on the cat, but we've lost all this. And, and this is not really due to the exposure. They actually, this is probably actually a good exposure. This just has to do with time of day and location of the photograph. This, however, is just way underexposed. So the first thing you're gonna have to do for something like this is bring it out. And now you can start to see we're getting this weird color and you're gonna introduce green and noise into your image. This is not something that you wanna do. You also ruin the tonal gradations. These tend to have highlights and lack of shadow detail when you have to start bringing things out two, three stops in an image. So it's not something that you actually wanna do. An image like this, I personally would not use it. And this is our last image you can see right here. We've lost basically the highlight detail on the face. Now, can I bring most of that back? Yes, but we're still gonna have these weird specular highlights. So this is another image. Can I save it? Absolutely, I can come in here and probably of save it, but we're still gonna have this weird looking area right here. And it's it really, really important in photography to have really good exposures. If you do any one thing in photography, get good at taking exposures. That's gonna make a world of difference in what you do. First of all, it's gonna save you time. You don't wanna spend 45 minutes on every single photo toning it. If you can do it in two or three seconds, that's, that's what you wanna do. In this image, it hardly needs any adjustment. I might bring her face out a little bit and just overall open the image up a teeny bit, but that's all you're gonna to need to do in this image. 
in this image, in this image, in this image, we're going to be spend a lot of time editing it. And for this little picture of a cat, is it really worth it in this photo to spend all this time trying to bring back some detail or getting this looking good? Not really. Step number three is going to be Adobe Camera Raw or any raw conversion program. Learn how to use it. They can make a world of difference. If you learn how to do any one thing in raw, it gets your color accurate. I don't actually color balance my images anymore in camera because I shoot only raw because I can do it much more accurately after the fact. Over here, we've got white balance and we've got this as shot. And if we click on this, it's giving us basically the same options that we have on our camera. So if I want to see what this looks like shot tungsten, look weird, but it allows us to change after the fact. So we can go through these and try different ones. And usually these are going to get you pretty close, but then you can come in here into temperature and tint and adjust those and, and refine that a little bit more. And this makes a world of difference. I can't tell you how many times I get people bringing photos into Photoshop before they've color balanced them. It is much easier to actually color balance raw than in Photoshop. So this is going to be a good example. We'll go ahead and open this guy up a lot so we can see him. You can see he's just like yellow, really yellow. So this is when I can come in here and hit auto. That didn't do anything. I'm going to just drop this down. And that's looking better. This is looking much more realistic. So we're getting some of that super saturation. What happens is when you open an image up, like I did right here a lot, it increases the saturation of the colors they're made up of. So in this, it's mostly red and yellow. And so it's super saturated that yellow. And if I don't do this adjustment, see how almost neon glowing yellow who is. So I can go in here and I could try a few of these different ones here. So I could try cloudy. I could try shade, see what gives me the best image. In this case, nothing really is that accurate or giving me a great one. So I'm just going to manually use these sliders. I do not usually adjust tint unless my subject is magenta. Um, I'm not a big fan of magenta. It's very difficult to deal with. So I'll typically make somebody a little bit more green to get rid of magenta if it's in their skin tones. But usually you don't have to adjust the tint too much. It's usually basically the temperature slider that you're adjusting there. So you can see we've got a much better image here. Is it perfect? No, I can still go in here and do this. And you can start to see, or at least I can, where it's starting to fall apart in the shadows. And this is due to extreme use of sliders that our exposure was way far off. So this is where this image should have been. And what is this going to give us? It's going to give us a better exposure of these values and probably allow us to, to bring down highlights a little bit more than we can in this image here. So I always tell my students, first year students, if you learn anything in Adobe Camera Raw, make sure that you do color balance first. It should be the very, very first thing that you do and then move on. The next step after you've made the temperature adjustments or of course, in this case, I made the exposure adjustment so I could see what the color looked like first because it was so off. But basically then we're going to come in here and make some global adjustments. And when you make global adjustments, they affect the whole image. The problem is if you make this image brighter, it might make this area look better, but it's making this area more blown out. You don't want to make an adjustment, a global adjustment, and make one area look better and one area look worse. If you run into that, that's where making selective adjustments is going to come into effect. But people always ask me, how much should I do in Adobe Camera Raw? And basically what I try to do, I understand what I can do well in Adobe Camera Raw and what I can do better in Photoshop. So I try to do the things that get my image looking better. Adobe Camera Raw, and that mainly consists of color balance, minor, and I stress this, minor global adjustments, and then selective adjustments. So in this case, I'll just make a quick brush selective adjustment. So we'll just go ahead and paint over this and darken this. And look, if you don't know how to use Raw, this is not going to be the video to do that. Got my density way down here. 
this video is geared more towards just these five steps, not how to do specific tasks. If you're interested in that, I've got tons of videos on how to use Adobe Camera Raw. So in this case, we'll come in here and we'll just, we can darken this area a little bit. I can also darken the highlights a little bit. And so we're just kind of bringing that back down. This is what we call a selective adjustment. So in this case, it adjusted just this area and didn't affect another area. And that's basically what I'll do. And I might make a couple of selective adjustments. I tend to use selective adjustments more than global adjustments. So learning how to use Adobe Camera Raw to just get your image in a basic better spot before you throw it into Adobe Photoshop. And what we'll do is I'm not gonna adjust all four of these images. I'm just gonna go ahead and select them all and send them to Adobe Photoshop. All right, so we're in Photoshop now and step Number four is do not set white or black and learn to use the info palette. So this is our info palette over here. You would go to window info. And then once you get this, it won't be by default like this. You will need to change one to RGB and more importantly, one to K. And what you would do is click on the little eyedropper and then select what you want. In this case, we have RGB and over here we have grayscale. The grayscale is going to be the number that I'm looking at the most. So let's take a look at the histogram of this image. And I'll come up here. I'm going to click curves because that's what I mainly use. And I'm actually going to bring this out just so everybody can see it. And it's bigger and it makes more sense. So this is our histogram. And what you'll notice, there's a little space right here and there's space up here, meaning that there's no data in this area of the image. This area of the shadows, there's no real dark, dark, darks, and there's no bright, bright, bright highlights. It's missing that. This is where our image is. And so there's a process in Photoshop called optimization. And the, the theory is that you slide the sliders over to where the histogram starts. And this can work in most images. Same thing over here, we can slide this over to where we do it. In this case, this is making the image brighter or the highlights brighter. And the troublesome area in this photo is this way overexposed area of the face. The last thing that I wanna do is optimize something that's making it look worse. When I did the blacks, it, it's not really doing so much to the image. And usually I don't go over to right where it starts, I go to just before that area a little bit. I tend to like to tone flat, so I'm not gonna actually optimize this image, but sometimes you can find it. Now up here are our blacks, whites, and grays, and this is where you would be setting whites and setting gray. And the reason this doesn't work is because it's really simple. You come in here and you set white, and it just color corrects, and it sets a specular white, meaning a white with no detail. So you can see when I was looking over here, it went from 6% to 0%. So when I look at that over on the K, it's a 6%, meaning it was at six and now it's at zero. So there's no detail there, there's nothing, and it's gonna show up as a big white splotch. We don't want that. We wanna have detail in the side of the face. So we're not gonna do that adjustment and we don't wanna set white. And just in the same way, if we get a black and we set black of where black should be, which might be over here, you can see it increases the contrast. That's not helpful to us at this point we are never gonna use 100% black in the first spot. I don't usually tone because most printers print 100% black. They're usually printing around 97, 98. That's kind of the best spot for them. And you can see we've lost all that detail here. So we don't wanna set black and white, not a fan of it in photography, because I can manually do this stuff out shifting color. And I can read all that information over here in this K value. So if I take my pointer and I go over there, you can see this is saying that's 90% and that's 6%. Well, I know that a bright highlight on the side of someone's face should be than 6%. So what does that mean? Well, it means that I actually need to darken that area to get more detail. No, I should have done this in raw. And normally I would do this in raw, but for this video, I'm showing you here because I can show you how it works. So now when I'm hovering over that, you can see on the right hand side, it was at six and now we're at 12%, which is a whole lot better. 
So people are always going to ask me, uh, well, how do you know what percentage something should be experienced? There's, there's no charts. It, it just kind of depends on what you're doing. But eventually you'll learn. The important part is you learn where to read. Now, if you look over on the RGB, it's saying that it's now at 230, 225, and 206. Those are your colors. And that's much more difficult to understand and learn to read. But it's showing you, you know, where your color shift is. In my case, my monitor is calibrated. So I can tell that this is yellowish right here. And, and that's the reason of kind of those weird numbers. If your numbers are ever the same, meaning if it was 230, 230, 230, that would say that something's a, a neutral gray. So if I go back here where it looks like it's grayish, um, I can look at those numbers. Now you can see it's 54, 56, 63, meaning there's a blue in this image. If it was all 54, 54, 54, this would be a perfect neutral gray. And in life, neutral gray doesn't really hardly exist ever unless you're shooting with a seamless background or something like that. So the goal of, of course, step number four is to not set these. Occasionally learn to optimize your image. Learn to read the info panel because as you make adjustments and I'm using curves, I want to read what I'm doing. So I can read here in his head and I'm telling this is 56%. That's way too dark. So though I made it a global adjustment and I made this area look better, I made everything else look worse. So in this case, I'm just going to hit command I and I'm going to apply that just to the face by painting it in. So I can take my white brush into the mask wherever I paint white is going to apply this adjustment that I made right here. And now it's dark in that face, but not the whole other image. And what I'm really trying to do in photography is just even these tonal values out. That's it. It was too hot. I'm knocking it down. If it's too dark, I'm opening it up. And we will take the properties and I will slide this back here to where I had it. Step number five, and this is an easy one. We will assume that I'm finished toning this image. I'm going to save this as a PSD. I mean, I'm going to go to file, save as, and I want to save this as the Photoshop file, meaning that this is a toned image, but not a sized image. Now, I'm not going to save it because I'm not actually going to use it. And the reason is, is I always want to have this to be able to go back to because somebody might get this printed, let's say 11 by 14, and they come back to you in a week and say, oh, can I make it 16 by 20? Because it's easier to resize from your original image than it is from a sized sharpened image. And sharpened is point number five. Never sharpen until after you've sized your image. Sharpening is something that we basically need to do because we have anti-aliasing filters on our cameras and the images come out a little bit soft. Learning to sharpen accurately is kind of a trick. You'll find tons of different videos that stress different ways to sharpen. And it is true, some do work a little bit better. I actually, most of the time, use the oldest method, which is my favorite, which is on sharp mask. I'll show you in a second. But the amount that you sharpen is really the key aspect. You don't want to over sharpen your image. Sharpening actually does nothing more than creating contrast between two areas. Meaning is create harder edge right here between two different areas or here and here. We don't want to sharpen this area. And this is a great example. Remember I said losing detail. See, this is detail lost. This is how it's going to show up when you print it. It's just this weird flat gray area. That's because there's no detail left in it. And this is because this area was overexposed. So even though I was able to bring this down, there's no detail in it. So it was all I really did was gray it out. This is gonna look absolutely horrible. So let's go ahead and take a look at this image instead. We don't wanna sharpen her face or her skin. Well, why? Because it's gonna make it look like she has nasty skin pot marks all over her face. We want the skin to stay smooth. What we want to do is sharpen areas of contrast, meaning the skin and the eyebrow. So we want to make this pop 
these edges pop. And what sharpening does is one side will get darkened, one side will get lightened. And what that does is create contrast and that contrast makes it look sharper. So if we go in here and we wanna sharpen our image, the first thing we wanna do is size our image first because that is gonna matter on the amount of sharpening. You do not wanna sharpen first and then size. So we're gonna go in here to image size and there's a whole bunch of different ways to size an image. I'll do this simply so people can see what I'm doing. We'll make our width this seven inches. So it's almost a five by seven, but not quite. So it's seven inches wide at 300 pixels per inch. I'll hit okay. You can see it's gonna make it a lot smaller. Hit command zero to make it bigger and we'll zoom in. All right, so you can see I zoomed in and right up here, you're gonna see 400%. When you sharpen, you wanna look at your image at 100%. So you could actually just go view at 100%. On, on my screen, it's this size. I have a 5K monitor. If you have an HD monitor, the image might be a lot larger on your screen. What's important is that you see it at 100%. Because this is gonna give you a perfect example of how much the sharpening is gonna do. And you're gonna see it in the Unsharp mask, it's gonna give us a little preview window as well. So in my case, I'm gonna to go to filter. And when you sharpen, you always must be on an image. If you have a layer, you can't sharpen that. You have to be on the image layer. I'm gonna to go to filter, sharpen. And the two main sharpening methods are smart sharpen and unsharp mask. Unsharp mask is the old way. Smart sharpen is the new way. It's three you don't use. There are other sharpening methods. We're not gonna get into them, but I have a whole video on different ways to sharpen. In my case, I actually like Unsharp Mask better, but I'll show you Smart Sharpen first. So you can see right here, we have a preview window. Move this over here so it's easier to see. Well, why do they have it at 100%? Well, because we know that when we're sharpening, we wanna see things at 100%. So I can move this over so I can see our subject or the area that I care about. And right here we have an amount, a radius, and reduced noise. I'm gonna leave reduced noise at its default. Radius should always be about one. And what that means is how much edge contrast you have. Radius, think of it as a pixel. So it's gonna do one pixel this way, one pixel this way. So one pixel this way is gonna get darkened, one pixel this way is gonna get lightened. If we did a radius of five, it's gonna do five pixels this way, five pixels this way. You get a weird halo, it doesn't look good. Amount is how much of that sharpening. So you can see as I increase this, you can see in that little preview and right here, it's making things crazy, way too sharp. This is what we call over sharpened. So your sharpening is gonna be dependent on the image and the image size. The smaller the size of the image, going to use less amount. The larger the image, you're going to use more. On an image like this, I might use somewhere between 40 and 50% for sharpening. If it was smaller, a web image, I might go down to 25 or 30%. If it was an 11 by 14, I might go up a little bit to 60%. This is something that you have to learn how to do. And when you make this adjustment, you can see it both in this image and the preview image. And what you don't wanna do is over sharpen your image. Because remember, you're creating contrast, meaning you're making one area brighter. So you can actually lose detail, highlight detail by doing that. In this case, I'm just gonna go ahead and leave this at 50% because I know that's a pretty good amount of sharpening for this image. I'm gonna hit okay, and just like that, we're done. And the other one up here under filter, and we drop down to sharpen is unsharp mask. And this is kind of the old one, but I actually prefer this because of the threshold. And threshold's a little bit hard to explain, but think of it as a grayscale. If we look at a face, the tonal values are all the same. So we don't wanna sharpen any of those. So the further threshold, meaning the higher the number, the better chance we're not gonna do that. What threshold is looking for is contrast difference. So right here you can see we don't really wanna sharpen this area because all the values are the same. 
So if we had our threshold at zero or one, it's still gonna sharpen these because the values are close. As we increase the number, the values have to be further apart, meaning like from white to black difference. So I have mine about four, sometimes I go up to six. So what this is saying is any area that has a strong brightness to shadow difference is gonna get sharpened on that edge. So right here we have white to gray, that's a strong color difference. So this edge is gonna get sharpened. But right in here or on the skin tone where the values are close, it's not gonna sharpen those areas. And so I like that because it gives me a lot of control over what I wanna do. The amount is basically exactly the same as I did in Smart Sharpen. So in this case, I'd probably move this down to around 50, looking at this preview at 100% and this preview at 100%, and that's pretty good. And I would hit OK, and now we've sharpened our image. And then you can save this image out for whatever output you want, whether um, it's a JPEG, a TIFF, uh, however the people want the file. That's not important at this point. What is important is that you sharpen after you size. Huge difference in photography. And that's basically it. Now, obviously there's a lot of stuff in between, but if you wanna treat every image and get good quality images, if you can follow these five simple steps of shooting raw, good exposure, use Adobe Camera Raw to especially adjust color in the beginning, do not set white and black and use the info palette, you're gonna have a much better image. And then do not sharpen until after you size. I see a lot of people in Adobe Camera Raw that boost the clarity and sharpness because they shot their photo out of focus. An out of focus image is an out of focus image. Increasing sharpness and clarity isn't gonna make it any more in focus. So you don't wanna do those steps in the beginning. Actually, I never sharpen or use clarity on an image. If you're gonna use clarity, you can do that in Photoshop. It's adding basically dynamic contrast and sharpening to an image. This is something that you're gonna benefit by doing at the end, not at the beginning. Well, hopefully this video has been helpful. If you have any comments or questions, you can leave those below. And as always, don't forget to subscribe.